How's it going, world? It's Tarl Yarber with Fixated Real Estate, and I'm here with some amazing human beings that we are very excited to bring back to you. Uh, actually, not back to you. This is the first time you guys are here, except for Jay, right? We love Jay. So we're doing these every couple of weeks for you guys because of what's going on in the world, and we want to make sure that you guys are informed as best as you can, as best as we can provide to you with what's happening out there and what's happening to our businesses, what's happening to other people's businesses, and the changing in the global economy. So in this particular webinar today, uh, we're going to go over opportunities. A lot of us in a lot of the panelists here are in different real estate industries and different niches. Uh, and we want to discuss what's happening today, how to navigate what's going on, what we're doing in our businesses, as well as the possible opportunities that might be out there in the future and what we're spectating on uh, that might be able to help you guys that are suffering or going through challenges uh, today. So there's a brighter future ahead of us. At some point, we don't know what it's going to be, but jumping into it, uh, I'm excited to introduce these panelists. So the first panelist we have is Mr. Brandon Turner. So what's going on, Brandon? How are you? I, I'm fantastic. How about you? <laughs> fantastic. So let's talk about you for a second. Enough about me. So Brandon Turner I like is talking the, about me. I'm good at that. Love oh, I love it. So Brandon Turner is a real estate entrepreneur and host of the top rated Bigger Pockets podcast with over 379 episodes and over 90 million downloads. He is also one of the VPs at Bigger Pockets, one of the one of the web's largest real estate investing communities. Actually, it's the one largest. Of, one of, yeah. Yeah, I think it's the largest now. Additionally, Brandon is the author of the best-selling books such as the book on rental property investing, the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down, and several other books. You probably got, what, 10 books now and you're writing another one from what I heard? Uh, I don't know, too many. Too many, too many to count. All right. Brandon started Open Door Capital, focusing on mobile home parks, and has acquired hundreds of units, uh, and is on track to be well over a thousand by the end of the year, which we're going to get into for sure. Next, we have Mr. AJ Osborne. Some of you guys may not know not know who AJ is, but I guarantee you, after this panel and this webinar, you guys are going to want to know him very, very well. So, AJ Osborne has been a leader in the storage industry since 2003. He specializes in acquisitions, development, conversion, and property management. The current Keylock portfolio covers over a million square feet and is expanding. He's helping to usher in new technology into the industry by opening a 120,000 square foot conversion that he has ran completely off of mobile phones. That's pretty sweet. Let's hear more about that soon. He started and runs the largest self-storage podcast called Self Storage Income as well. You have another podcast, don't you? Yeah, we do. We have a cash flow to freedom one that focuses on finance. But My wife loves that one. Good one. So, and last but not least, one of my besties, Mr. Jay Scott. He is an entrepreneur, technologist, investor, and advisor. He's also host of the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast. He is author of four Bigger Pockets books, including the book on flipping houses, the book on estimating rehab costs, the book on negotiating real estate, and recession proof investing, which seems to be a timely novel. So, real estate investor that's completed over 400 deals since 2008, including flipping, buy and hold, multifamily, notes, lending, development, blah, and new blah, construction, blah, blah. and blah, 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 blah. You know, he's a, I guess he's legit. Moving on. So, Brandon Turner, let's start with you. Despite everything that's going on, uh, prior to the pandemic and everything that's been happening in the world, uh, you had been really, really hardcore focus on mobile home parks, right? And I know right now a lot of people are looking for recession-proof investing, whatever that is, if that's even legally allowed to say. Uh, and you were pushing mobile home parks for quite a bit. You were raising funds for mobile home parks. Uh, and you've been doing that really only for the last 12 months from what I remember, right? And so are you still, what's going on with that? Are you have, you've acquired properties. What's happening to your business now, despite what's happening in the world? Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm terrified. I'm just selling everything. I'm just kidding. No, uh, things <laughs> things are uh, things are still. We're moving ahead. In fact, we're we're looking at this very much as an opportunity. Uh, you know, it's that whole like you can look at this as an obstacle or an opportunity. Uh, it's that whole mindset of this is not happening to us. It's happening for us. So I've been trying to keep that mentality. Uh, so no, we're still hard charging forward. We're still. I mean, we're on our second fund right now. We have two parks under contract right now. Two big uh, portfolios that we're uh, working towards and due diligence. And yeah, like you said, we should be at a thousand by the end of the year. So yeah, we are, we're still moving forward, but that's because I, I, I still believe that mobile home parks are going to be pretty darn recession resistant. And I'm, I'm hesitant to say that so much. Uh, I hope it doesn't come out that I'm pushing that. Cause it's not like the best thing in the world. There's a lot of good investments out there. Uh, it's a very, very difficult niche, but that's why I like it. Cause I like difficult things that, uh, uh, that most people will give up before they get into it. So y'all should just give up before you get into it. It's just, <laughs> so, 
Yeah, don't be a competition. So, so despite yeah. what's happening right now, you guys are still looking for acquisitions. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we're like, we've upped our game. I mean, we're contacting every broker we have a relationship with uh, saying, hey, if, if anything falls apart, if you have any clients that are running for the hills because they're scared, we're not, we're still buying, we've got money, we've, we're, we're confident, send us your deals. And that's actually like just shaking all those trees has been really uh, helpful so far. And we've gotten some uh, really good leads off of it. And uh, yeah, we're, I mean, we're like, we're, we're pushing forward uh, quickly because again, like the cool thing about like rental properties is like, yeah, the market could still drop. Like we don't know. Right. Like the market yeah. could drop 20%, 30%, like a hundred percent. Like I, let's hope not, but like it could happen. But every property we buy is cash flowing from day one. Like we won't buy anything that's not cash flowing from day one. So, uh, you know, rents could drop a little bit and we'd still be okay. And the property values could plummet. We'd still be okay. We're still going to provide good returns. So that's kind of what we're doing. So on that topic, like, and I'll, I'll ask Jay and AJ this as well, because this is probably what's on a lot of people's minds right now is May 1st is coming up, right? And you have mobile home parks. So a lot of times they're renting the lots, not the actual units, right? So it's a little different. Uh, in April, in the beginning of April, how was your rent roll? Like, were you having any challenges with rents there? Uh, what was happening to your portfolio, including you have a portfolio in Gray Harbor, Grace Harbor, Washington, right? Or I do. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. I got like 20 some units left in Grace Harbor, Washington, where I lived for a decade. Uh, yeah, we were, I mean, we were, we were completely normal. I mean, we had a hundred percent rent collection better than normal within like four days of the month of, of uh, April, which was surprising. And I think people were just like, everyone's a little, like, there's a lot of like worry, right? Like none of us knew what was going to happen. And I think everyone was like, Oh, what's going to happen? Our tenants going to pay rent. And you get all this like news report of like, like governor saying like, don't worry about paying your rent. Like, it's just like ridiculous. Anyway, no, none of that really happened. Uh, in our mobile home park fund, we're over 95% rent collected at this point. That was a week ago, we were 95%. So we're probably at like, I don't know, 97, 98 by now, which is pretty typical That's for where we'd be. Probably normal, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. normal, yeah. Now what's Megan to do? I don't know, but I tend to kind of fall in the same way. I think that a lot of money got injected from the government. So hopefully most of our tenants can do it. Another reason I like mobile home parks is because it's a lot easier to pay $200 for your rent than it is to pay $2,000 for your rent. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that if they, you know, that most people will be able to go and find 200 bucks uh, to be able to pay their rent. So that on that note, does the, is it an eviction if somebody doesn't pay your lot, their lot rent, or is that a different? Yeah, it differs area. a little bit and depends on where you're at in what state, but it's basically an eviction. Yeah. Okay. Now switching over to AJ, AJ, you're in a commercial space. Uh, do you have any multifamily as well or? Nope, uh, no, no multifamily have a commercial self and self storage facilities. So for you, you work. So this is you're the first person we've really had on here that is in solely the commercial space. And we haven't discussed a lot with what's going on with that, uh, especially with April 1st was rent paid. Right? A lot of businesses are having to shut their doors down forcibly. Uh, and even though they're calling it voluntary shutdown, it's kind of a play on words. But the uh, are you worried about May 1st? What is happening in the commercial industry? What's happening to your storage space? What's happening yeah, to your tenants? You know, we're not terribly worried. A lot like Brandon, in self-storage, you're dealing with people that, first of all, their, their rent amount is so substantially low in comparison to other things. It's actually one of the last things to go. We saw this during the recession. People, you know, I think a, a lot of assumptions were turned upside down when people assumed that letting go of your house was the last thing you would do. It actually turned out to be one of the first things people did and nobody let go of their storage unit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we see this when people get more mobile, those kind of things, uh, you know, self-storage actually goes up. So our collections have been good. We've seen um, no, uh, no uptick in bad debt. Um, so the biggest thing we've been hit with is not as much move-ins because people are staying in place. But with that said, occupancy has still slowly been rising. During this time, we usually see large spikes and we can get aggressive with rate increases. We can't do that right now because of the emergency orders by the states, but we're not, we don't have any, we haven't seen any revenue fall. We haven't seen um, delinquencies and everything yet. We hope obviously that'll continue. Like uh, Brandon, we don't know what uh, May will bring. We, our concerns associated in that space is that the, the longer and the higher the unemployment gets, you know, it's like a cancer that starts affecting everything. So even though we're we're kind of at the last, um, once you know, once employment it gets really bad, we believe we'll see a rise in, in delinquencies and and bad debt will go up. But as of now, we we haven't seen anything, and we don't expect it to be bad or catastrophic. We're under contract. 
um, with the deal, we're doing multiple developments. We're looking to buy. So we, in the next six months, we hope to have at least 10 to 15 million more locked down in self storage. And wow. we expect in the next two years to grow substantially. We grew very little in the last two years. Um, we completed basically one deal and we expect in the next two years, it'll be opposite. We'll grow a lot more. So you're, you're gearing up. Yes, very, very much so. So like, unlike, and there's, and that's the last couple of panels we've had, we've focused on residential as well as multifamily. Uh, and it's in uh, the perspectives from our first panel back on April 1st, or uh, yeah, right around April 1st, uh, was like big, huge question mark. We don't know what's going on. And I know there's still a lot of people that aren't paying on the multifamily route as far as rents are considered, depending on the market and where they're at. I know here in Seattle, there's like a whole, there's all sorts of groups of people that are trying to get together to like boycott paying rent right now. Uh, and it's kind of ridiculous what's happening in that department there. And so we've even had uh, all sorts of council people trying to pass laws, making it like illegal for us to even collect rent uh, from our tenants. And has anything like ha happened like that anywhere in the commercial space that you guys are aware of or mobile home park space or anything along those lines or? Kind of, and it, nothing to that extent at all. Where we get hit is so, you know, late fees and evictions and self storage. Um, if somebody doesn't pay their rent, they are eviction as we sell your stuff. And so you're renting a piece of, you know, property, you don't pay your rent, you have a certain amount of time to pay it. If not, it goes up for auction, your stuff gets out and I get a, a renter that'll pay in. Right now we can't do that. So we can't do auctions, we can't do late fees. Um, and so theoretically there is zero penalty if you don't pay us. Now, no one's caught on to that and <laughs> no one's not- Don't say that here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in Nevada, Washington, Oregon or Idaho, ignore that or Kansas or some other states that we're now in. But um, the, the, really the key about it is so many of us of our facilities are uh, not automated, but you know we have 92% um, that are just, you know it's direct draft, pay on your credit card, you're talking 65 bucks and people don't even notice it. Lots of times you'll give an eight, 10% rate increase, they don't even know they got it. Um, and uh, so we haven't seen payments be affected Although governments have absolutely put in place rules and restrictions on us that say you can't collect, it hasn't affected us at all except for uh, um, you know late fees, and that's why you worry about the bad debt collecting up because people stop paying, we can't kick them out. So now I have units that are occupied that are not paying units, and I can't get them out to fill them up with people that are paying. Mm -hmm. But still, until now, we haven't been really affected by those laws that have been put into place. Okay, that makes sense. So, uh, so Jay, you have, this is a question that I'm sure another number of people are asking right now is that we have Brandon Turner, who is like mobile home parks, go. And he's hmm. still looking for properties. You got AJ. No, who just they're, said, they're terrible. Don't go. Mobile okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, and you have AJ who's like, I'm gearing up to buy more development and do more self storage. And I'm going to increase my portfolio right now and go. I know that we've had, we've, you've been on our webinars a few times, uh, every one of them actually. And the, it, it's your, your perspective in the past, and I want to hear if it's still that way, is that do you believe right now is a time to be gearing up for anything? Or do you believe it's a time to sit back and wait? Or how do you feel what's where you should go right now in real estate or in business? Yeah, so certainly there are certain asset, asset classes that are more recession resistant than others. Um, and I know other people may not be uh, excited about using that term recession resistant. I have no problem using the term recession resistant. Uh, like mobile homes do tend to be pretty, pretty recession resistant. Uh, self storage does tend to be pretty recession resistant. Obviously there, ex uh, there are exceptions for everything. Um, we've seen a lot of exceptions during this, this recent uh, economic situation. Um, but, uh, and a good example of an exception just through, through this uh, recent pandemic is college rentals. Typically college rentals tend to be very recession resistant. Uh, when when people start to lose their jobs, they go back to work, or I'm sorry, they go back to school. And when people go back to school, they need a place to live. Uh, so college rentals typically do really well during a recession. Obviously, this time around, it could be a little bit different. It's not necessarily true that schools are going to go back to school in the fall or maybe even That's next a big spring. concern. Yeah. yeah. So it's possible that that in this case, college rentals could may not be a very good bet during this next economic downturn. Um, 
But historically, there are certain types of, of asset classes that do very well during recessions. Uh, medical centers tend to do well. If you are into retail, uh, grocery uh, anchored retail centers tend to do well. So any, any retail strip or, or strip mall that has a grocery store in it tends to do really well. People don't do a lot of shopping, but they're going to go buy food. Um, so what I suggest to people now, um, and, and then there are other things like buy and hold. Buy and hold works in any market. Um, if you if you underwrite conservatively, if you assume rents may drop a little, if you assume vacancy might go up a little bit, buy and hold tends to do pretty well. Um, and and so if you're looking at something that's recession resistant, if you're in one of those asset classes or you're doing buy and hold, then absolutely go for it. Find a great deal that's out there. I would say that right now. Um, I, I, my recommendations on powering forward versus kind of sitting back and waiting is going to have a lot to do with how experienced you are. Um, I like to say right now, if you have to ask me what you should be doing and how you should be doing it right now, you probably don't have enough experience to be doing it. Um, because there are a lot more risks at this particular point in, in, in this unique situation um, than we typically see. So I, I'm, I'm not one of those that says you always have to be buying. There's always something good out there to buy. Um, if somebody doesn't know what to do right now, great. Now's a perfect time to go pick up some books, to go read Bigger Pockets forums, to go listen to Bigger Pockets podcasts, to be listening to, to podcasts like this, go join the other fixated on real estate events, go watch the old uh, webinars that we've done. Now's a great time to be learning and educating yourself because mm -hmm. I think what we're in the midst of right now is, is hopefully near the end. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, at most the next month or two, we're going to get out of this lockdown and we're going to see the economy do something. Not we don't sure. know exactly Nothing. what it's going to do. We don't know Good how prediction. much it's going to re Yeah. yeah I, I don't want to predict. Um, but the economy is going to do something. It's going to settle somewhere. Um, and once it settles somewhere, that's the time to be starting to execute on the strategy. So use this time right now to really get educated and be prepared, have a plan so that when the lockdown ends and we know what's going on in the economy, you can get out there and execute. I, I, I like to use the, can I jump in with an analogy? Cause I like analogies. So yes, David I like, I like the, yeah, I like the analogy of dry, you're in a ship, right? And like, we just got, we're all on a boat. We're all pirates on a boat are, and like this big storm just came. Right. And like, just the boat went crazy and we're all like screaming like, arg. And then uh, a couple things could happen. The storm could stop completely. And then we all just go back to life as it was, or the storm might just continue indefinitely. But what we what will happen is we will settle into either a new calm or a new storm norm, right? So a new like we're like it's bumpy, but at least it's like bumpy that we recognize. And so the thing to do in this period is to get your sea legs, right? Like this is the time to like shore it. up to get good at sailing, so that way no matter what happens, whether it's good or bad, we have our sea legs in. And so you know like or you know the training up. So yeah, I love that point you made, Jay. I guess, I guess the, the there's two concepts there. One, Jay is also saying. You don't lose money on a deal you don't buy, basically. And if you feel that there's, you don't have to buy anything. And that's something I've been telling people for a while now. It's like, even for us, when this first happened, uh, I was like, cool, I'm not buying what I normally buy right now. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait and see a little bit. It's only been a few weeks. And I bought one property uh, in the last 30 days. And it was a almost a 30% cash on cash ROI uh, fix and flip. That was super easy with less than $10,000 in rehab going into it. I would be very silly not to buy that one right now, and despite what's happening in my opinion, right? But somebody that sends me a 15% cash on cash return, fix and flip or burr or whatever, because that's not even a real burr. Uh, I don't need to buy that. Why would I do that right now? Like, and yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. So why, why buy something with less margin, right? But if somebody keeps sending me stuff that's 30 plus percent, maybe I will buy that one, right? So, uh, cause even if it drops down a bit, then it's still a good deal in my opinion, right? For what I'm taking that risk on, but I don't have to, right? And then what, Brandon's also saying right now is on a, I like what you're saying too, on that concept is right now is the time that your business is either uh, being severely affected, which might mean that maybe there's some systems and some processes and some things that need to be adjusted in your current business to help you become stronger and get your sea legs for the future. And if you look at this as a positive light, is that right now is the time that it should be shaking your business up enough to see where the flaws and inconsistencies are. And a lot of people in the fix and flip industry and the burr industry and all that kind of stuff, they just run forward as fast as possible. 
and they don't know how they got there. And so now's the time to work on your systems and processes or else you will wind up underwater uh, if this continues going forward. So take that opportunity to do that. That's my opinion, at least. Yep. So now's also a great time to really be thinking about what's going to change based on this whole event. And we've talked in the previous webinars about things like, yeah, this could have an impact on the commercial space because people are accustomed to, to now working from home. It could have an impact on the tourism space because businesses might not send people around the country traveling. But then there are things that I, I've been thinking about a little bit more recently um, that, are, that are kind of interesting. So what's something that's, that's kind of stopped over the last couple months? People have stopped getting married. And when people stop getting married, uh, they don't necessarily have as many babies. A lot of people don't want to have a baby until they get married. Now, you could also say maybe the other side's true, where people have been locked in, in, their, in their homes with their spouses for months. So maybe there's going to be a whole lot more Lots babies. babies. <laughs> but so, so we don't know which way that's headed. But that's something that's a good thought experiment. From the same kind of thought experiment uh, standpoint, think of it this. The spike in divorce rate in China over the last month has been tremendous. I've read a couple articles wow. about how divorce rate in China has spiked. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I hopefully my wife doesn't divorce me when, when this whole lockdown ends, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did. There's going to be a lot of, okay, hopefully she doesn't, but um, but there could be a, a big spike in divorces thanks to, to this whole lockdown. I mean, people stuck with each other for a lot longer times than they have been in the past. How does that impact housing? How does that impact, impact real estate? Uh, if that's the case, there's going to be a demand for small single family homes, for apartments, for, for single units, one bedroom apartments, things that there typically isn't demand for. So there are all of these unintended consequences and all these potential ramifications that I think a lot of us haven't even thought about. But now's a great time to start thinking about that and thinking, now if I can get ahead of this, if I can really figure out what's likely to change based on this, I can implement a business plan and I can kind of be a first mover and I can take advantage of that before the competition catches up. Love it. So with what's happening right now, maybe Jay, you can help with this or AJ, uh, you know, we've had some discussions uh, as well about like the different changes in regulations, the different changes as far as the states are concerned. I mean, right now in Washington, uh, Governor Inslee has been making all sorts of adjustments like right now the construction just got released i might go down that i don't want to go on my soapbox but holy crap it's almost impossible to run a construction project with the requirements that have been set by governor Inslee here in the state of washington it's like he's like nobody in their expert panels have ever been on a construction site and i'm not talking about remodels i'm talking like i'm gonna go on my soapbox for a second you have a, you know, the conveyors that take, you're, you're in a high rise development of some sort, right? You have the conveyors that bring all your contractors up to the, the top, right? Typically every morning, they load up 20 people in one of those things, right? And they have to go up, right? Right now, they're only allowed three people in it at a time. And when it comes back down, you have to have a mandatory 10 minute stop to thoroughly clean it out before you can let three more people go in, right? A buddy of mine runs a, a, a door manufacturer company his guys took two hours to get allowed into a job site because of all the stuff that had to go on. You talk about the inefficiencies, everything. You're not allowed to work next to each other unless you're more than six feet apart, right? And how do you do that on the, so it's might as well, they might as well just shut it down and not even allow construction to happen because then you have uh, owners of the development saying, you guys can work, go get your stuff together. Then you have the GCs going subs, you figure it out. You guys get to, and it just keeps going down the line, right? So off my soapbox for a second. And I can keep going. And but that said, AJ, Jay, yeah, Raina. Yeah. this has been an interesting thing that we've been seeing is the government's reaction towards fear and public perception. And there seems to be like logic just vanished, right? Um, this lot this logic just vanishing across the marketplace, the definition of essential, non-essential business has dramatically impacted not only today, but will continue to impact. They're already talking about we need to define what is an essential business where those supply chains come from, how to monitor and change those supply chains. This is gonna affect a lot of things in the real estate world, right? Um, and a lot of these governments have just over the top, they're, they don't even know what to do, so instead nobody do anything. Um, and we've seen this in development, we've seen this in how sales are done, um, and we can't depend on the government to make good choices because that just doesn't work. So one of the things that we've done what? though is to your Come advantage. On. I know, I know you're shocked. 
<laughs> so one of the things that you've done is we've had we've had projects where we're like, listen, normal due diligence, 60, 90 days, we need it to be 120. Because with everything that's going on, we can't get things done or make decisions and spread it out. Um, because you have a, you have, you know, there was 11 construction deals. We were just um, talking with a guy in, in Washington, all of them in mid construction were basically kicked off the lot. You can't depend on that. You can't. And so what this does to funding, when you're going back and talking to a bank saying, we can't get the project done, expenses are going up. Um, you know, this causes issues in the overall supply chain of the market. And when you look at it, some of the advantages though are people that are worried about markets being overbuilt as far as housing, storage, all these different things, you're gonna see a contraction. And this contraction is kind of artificial because it's government mandated contraction. Um, it, it allows you to be more picky, right? Mm -hmm. As you talked about before, Tarl, you're looking at the best deals. You're not taking subpar deals. And those, those, those really good deals will start to float to the top. People that were on the fence are going to get off the fence one way or another. They're either jumping in, they're getting off. Lenders are making clear lines. Um, so this is a time that if you take action, you know, you need to use these things to your advantage because the government doesn't know what the future holds. They're making ridiculous laws and you have to plan on them not being logical for a long time to come <laughs> because they won't. Yeah, once, once they pass a law, you know how this works, right? Once a law is passed, just take the construction on the side. Okay, Washington, they geared up to get construction passed so they can go to it. Cool. They make their whole ridiculous, retarded, stupid, yes, I think it's ridiculous uh, rules on it. And then they go, okay, that industry set aside. Now let's work on the next industry. And they're going to go work on that. And then another one. And they forgot about construction and how like, and it might be months from now before they change and they it don't again. They, they, have to go they don't say we're losing this many people in jobs. Medical supply chains are breaking down. Food supply chains are breaking down. Financial uh, supply chains are breaking down. The government's not looking at repercussions of any of this. They're just simply reacting, 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 reacting as fast as they can. Um, you can't be like that. When you're in the investing game, when you're in the business, you need to analyze the repercussions of these actions. They are very large and lots of times will affect your business greatly. One of the hard things too is every state's doing it differently. So we're in five states. We've got under contract in four more states. And it's from Washington to Idaho, which could not be farther apart, right? To the Midwest and the East Coast. Um, and every single state is playing by their own rules. It's like the governors kind of put a, a crown on and they said, this is all mine now and I get to make up all the rules. Um, and that changes dramatically state by state. And you gotta be aware of it. And you gotta be looking out to see what's gonna happen over the next two months. So for, so you made a comment, and this is one of the concerns. I'm going to share the poll results results here in a second. Uh, but one of the concerns, like you brought up, say, hey, there's going to be times for opportunities. And even though you don't have to buy the best one, you could cherry pick, sorry, all of them, you could cherry pick the best ones and be a little bit more selective. But one of the big concerns that I'm going to share the results, uh, one of the big concerns that's been brought up to the to us is that investors will not be able to get funding, right? Because yes. right now, hard money lenders, if you just look at traditional lenders, I'm uh, sorry, fix and flip single family, a lot of hard money lenders have pulled, uh, they've closed their doors. Multifamily and commercial lending is becoming extremely difficult uh, to get. And so, and I know Brandon, you raised a fund. Did you do any kind of uh, like lending on that or is it all purely just cash with the fund or how do you guys do in your acquisitions for, for mobile home park? Because I would definitely want to talk about the multi and commercial side for sure, but. Yeah. Yeah. We get, we get loans. So we typically are like 65% roughly uh, of the, you know, the value. So like we raise, you know, the rest is down payment. So yeah, we're, we're getting, uh, I mean, we haven't closed anything in a month. And so like, you know, stuff could change, but we're getting positive at least. Yes, we can still do it. Um, and we're moving forward on the stuff that we are. So yeah, we, we feel comfortable ish so far. Obviously there's been a massive slowdown. Uh, rates are actually a little bit higher than they were. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just being very cautious with it. But so far, we haven't been denied the ability to get these loans that we're pursuing. So they're still moving forward. Because at the end of the day, like like AJ said, it's government mandated, not a more, you know, foundational problem in American society. So like these banks still want to lend because they still need to make money so they can still pay their employees. And like, they still have to keep moving forward. So we have been seeing movement there. And uh, what about you, Jay? Have you seen much going on in that realm as far as, because one of the other concerns is that, you know, people are going to miss out on opportunities. Actually, that was the number one concern that came back on the poll was that 
I'm going to miss all these opportunities and look back. And if you see them, but you can't get funding, what do you do? So I, it's funny. I saw that and I was curious when people said they're concerned about missing opportunities. Um, that's not clear to me if they're saying they're concerned about missing opportunities because they're not going to be able to take them down because they don't have funding or they don't have knowledge or experience, or if they're just concerned that they're not going to be able to find the deals, that, they're, that there are great deals out there that they're not seeing. Um, I mean, one thing I'll say to the people that are concerned about missing out on deals is um, in, in this type of environment, patience is a virtue. Um, I, I think there's a lot that's going to change over the next few months. And I'm not necessarily doom and gloom and saying everything's going to collapse. Um, I personally do think things are going to get worse. Um, but regardless of whether things get worse or better, things are going to change. And right now, we haven't hit that kind of steady state, like where the economy is going to be. What Brandon was talking about earlier, with we don't know if that storm is going to continue or if it's going to stop. Um, and pretty soon, we're going to know. And that's when the deals are either not going to present themselves because everything's going to get better and we're going to go back to where we were three months ago, or deals are going to present themselves. But right now, I mean, if you look at the data, I mean, GDP just came out for Q1 and it was negative 4.8%, which to put that in perspective is kind of like the worst economic quarter that the country's had since 2008 and the, mm. the, the second worst since like going back to the 80s. Um, but that's artificial. Um, the, the numbers mean nothing right now. So just because we see unemployment at 27 million, we see GDP at negative 5%, just because we see whatever horrible numbers we see, oil, oil going negative, it's artificial. It means nothing. And a lot of people are still, they're, they're still optimistic. There's still a lot of optimism in the market, especially in real estate. And we're not seeing a lot of deals. So if anybody's out there thinking, I'm missing deals right now. I need to be out there buying. I'm locked down in my house and everybody else is buying up these great deals. There aren't a ton of those great deals out there. Now, obviously, if you're a great real estate investor, you're going to find those deals in any market. But this isn't 2008. This isn't like everywhere you look, there's going to be a great deal. So don't feel like you need to be buying today or tomorrow or the next day. If it's another month or six months or 12 months, that's fine. So that, that's the first thing I'll say. Second, with regards to lending, there's a lot of uncertainty. So um, in, the, in the conventional space with the GSEs, the big Fannies and Freddies, um, what we're seeing is, or what people I've, I, that are borrowing um, are seeing is that they're still lending. Um, Fannie and Freddie have no aversion to lending right now. It's the banks, the lower banks, the ones that you're actually going to talk to, the Chases and the Wells Fargos um, that originate the loans that are starting to get a little bit concerned. They know they that have a good they, reason they, to, though. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, you think about what, what Fannie and Freddie are telling them and all the, and the GSEs are saying is that if people default on their loans, even within the first couple of months because of the required forbearance yep, that yep. they're allowing people to do, they're not going to buy the loans back. Yeah. Right. And so now they've changed that recently. They'll do that, but they'll buy the loans from the banks at an extreme cost, almost like 14 to 16 loans for yep. profit for that bank to cover one loan that they sell that they were forced to give full brands to. So of course they're going to tighten that stuff up, right? Yeah. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing higher credit score requirements. We're seeing higher reserves for investment properties um, and not even just banks that, that are reselling their loans up to Fannie and Freddie, but portfolio lenders. So I've talked mm -hmm. to a number of portfolio lenders recently um, and it's funny. It's, it's really, it's all over the board. So I have a local portfolio lender. I've never worked with them, um, but they're telling me that they're still lending at tremendous, tremendously good rates, um, tremendously high LTV, 85% uh, loan, loan to value, not loan to cost, loan to value. Um, and, and they say they have plenty of money. And then I talked to a, a, a portfolio lender in Georgia that I've worked with a bunch and, and people are telling me that they can't get loans that they've been getting for 10 years um, regardless of their credit, regardless of their relationship with the bank. So what we're seeing right now is things are just all over the board. There's, there is no, I mean, we talk about the new normal. We don't know what the new normal is and things are, are everywhere and, and don't yeah. trust the numbers. Don't trust what I tell you because what I'm seeing with my banks and the people I talk to are going to be different than the people Brandon's seeing, different than the people, than what you're seeing, different than what AJ's seeing, different than what everybody's seeing. Everything is, it's not even just local now. It's hyper local, and it's this bank might be doing something, and the bank next door might not. Um, so, so to talk about what's going on in the market or or in lending is really tough right now because there's no uniformity at all. Well, I think well, it's, 
it's important to understand too that when when you get in these market cycles where everything's up in the air and things are moving so fast banks do a freeze model so interest rates may be zero but they're not going to give you interest rates at zero so most of the time they set floors so the cmbs market's basically gone it's not existent in operating today in its normal form that was the first to go it always is so the cmb S market, which is the bond market. So you collateralized your debt, you put it together, it gets sold off on the bond market. It's non-recourse. That market has disappeared. Um, that means we're moving on to the frontal markets, insurance companies for non-recourse, banks, investment banks will do non-recourses. So that market shifted. All the loans went to these frontal markets. They have all the opportunities to take the best deals in the world. So they're selecting the deals they want, but two, because I don't know what's going to happen in three, four weeks, I'm setting a floor at 4% interest, and that's just what we're doing. So deals were coming to the table, and they were not telling you what they were locking the interest rate is until it closed, because the bank didn't know. They go, I, I can't tell you right now what interest rates are, because things are moving so fast. That's a really hard environment for anyone to operate, but especially a bank that's got to put these things under contract for 30 years, and I don't know what is going to happen in the next two days. So we've seen a lot of the freeze up has nothing to do with banks not being well uh, collateralized. They are, the feedback's the same. We have money, we're ready to give money. We wanna do it, then let's do it. What's the interest rate? I have no idea. <laughs> so the execution of what they're trying to do is where we're, you know, that's where we're getting in trouble here. That's where we're having the problems. Everything's starting to get jammed up, freezed up. There's a lot of unknowns. People are working from home. It's just harder to get a lot of these things done. And as far as getting deals, seeing deals or missing deals, um, I think, first of all, if you're trying to time markets, that's a horrible way to do it. I would have taken a deal two years ago that I'd take a deal today. Still would. If I find a deal that meets my criteria, I'm doing the deal, right? And two, I prepared my financials for today, not today. So I got ready for the opportunity and we've gotten ready for the opportunity that comes. That happens two years before. If you want to get ready to get lending and get access to deals and have your network, that's not something you put together in the middle of the storm. That's something that needs to be done. Now, scramble, try to get it done. Yeah, but deals will come up and they will happen, but liquidity is not a problem in the market like 2008. So we're not gonna see deals all over because there are buyers and banks will lend money. So those deals will get, you know, they're gonna get eaten up, right? I don't believe you're gonna see massive cap rates. You're not gonna be driving around picking deals I, we don't see any of that happening. Hmm. So even what you said, and I know some of the listeners here, they're just starting out uh, or they've been just going hundred miles an hour and leaving a trail of chaos behind them. Uh, so when you said that having your finances together was something you should have done two years ago, uh, that might not help those people today. But maybe what we're also trying to say is that your future self will thank you if you start working on it even today, because is, is that is an excuse to not take care of it today because you're missing out possibly because you don't have the ability to get the funding. Well, you're gonna want that sooner or later, right? We'll find and somebody so, that has. So partner yeah. up with people on deals. So we're doing deals right now where somebody okay. comes to us and says, we're not in a position to sign on the dotted line. You are, but I've got the deal. I've got everything else, right? Real estate is a team effort. It's a group effort. So just because you may not be in a financial position to get a deal done and you have a deal, doesn't mean you can't get that deal done. That's just one piece that you don't have ready and you need to go out and find somebody that can help you knock that deal down. Yeah, there's like, there's essentially three things you need to do real estate. You need time, money, expertise, right? But you don't need to have all three. So the, you can find people, but you need those components to make a deal happen. So if you have the time, but you don't have the money or expertise, go find people that do or vice versa, you have the expertise. For, you know, when you, you start a flipping business, you need two years before of like consistency before most lenders are gonna lend to you, right? So what did I do for two years if I couldn't get a traditional loan, right? So I had to go partner with people and work with people without money. So it's, it's the same thing, right? And it's how often is it, AJ and Brandon and even Jay, that a company has 100% of their own capital, has 100% of their own uh, funding, their own lending requirements, their own construction, their own everything all in-house, completely vertically, vertically integrated to go build a storage unit or to go build multifamily or to go invest in a mobile home park or even flip a house. How often is it that a company has everything vertically set up that they can do it all in house? Like never. <laughs> they, they, don't, right? they, they don't want, I, I wouldn't yeah. invest in a company like that. No, I don't okay. want to do that. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to be a developer. I don't want to be a flipper. You don't want to be everything. It's, you, 
it's hard to grow that way. Nobody has nobody has every core competency. And if you're if you're in business doing things that don't mesh with your core competencies, you're being inefficient, you're losing money. Yeah. <laughs> we do what we're good at, or we should be doing what we're good at. Brandon's like for I sure. <laughs> All right. We're going to start switching gears to more on the opportunity side uh, and start getting to your guys' questions as we go. So uh Jay. Switching to you really quick, and if you keep it short and sweet, were you you originally were buying a company, if I remember, were you buying a a, a remediation company, or you, did you still do that? Or we we did that in January, and yeah. we're cruising along. And are you still looking for other businesses? Is that an opportunity you're looking for, or no? So we put a business under contract. Uh, we came to a verbal agreement late last night, so we're waiting for the purchase and sale agreement right now, but. We're looking, we're, we're hopefully going to sign a deal on a, a new business today or tomorrow. Would it, and would Brandon or uh, even AJ, were you, any of you guys even considering or looking outside of real estate in these opportunistic times or are you guys only focused on real estate? Brandon? Me? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I, I, I'm a big fan of specializing, right. And not building too many bridges over to, you know, financial freedom Island. Uh, that said, uh, if you can get the right systems in place so that other people are building those bridges, it's fine. So am I, am I looking? Yeah, I, I got a couple, like, I don't know, what's the phrase irons in the fire right now? Uh, because I've got teams in place to run the mobile home park stuff for the most part. So I don't have to focus, you know, 80 hours a week on that. So yeah, I'm working on a few things, not necessarily buying businesses though. Episode 51 of the bigger pockets business podcast definitely got my mind thinking differently. Oh, yeah. yeah. If you guys haven't listened to that, make sure you listen to that. It's really good. Jay, uh, interview. What was the guy's name? Nigel Niall. Geisinger. Uh, yeah, really, really good show. Oh, uh, Oregon. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So all about like the opportunity right now. It might not even be in real estate as much as it's in business, uh, in buying businesses, which is why it sounds like Jay, you're you're pursuing that. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea. I've I've had conversations. I don't AJ. Know contract. Yeah, we um, purchased one, um, and uh, we don't. You know, I I build my bridge, but uh, we partner up and we have an operator um, who's doing it online. We tripled sales and everything last month. Um, and we are, um, look, we're reviewing three other companies, um, sales companies. Um, uh, and as long as we have good operators, things like that, we think it's a fantastic mode and way to grow. And we think there'll be a lot of those opportunities. In fact, honestly, we think there'll probably be more business opportunities right now than real estate opportunities because the cash flow crunch associated with business with people not buying and selling being in sitting in place, I mean, you're still sitting in your house and storage units, but a, there's a lot of businesses in crisis. So we're looking, it has to be a good fit, but we purchased, yeah, one business and we're, we're open to purchase more in the next few months. I highly, highly recommend everybody listening to go check out the Bigger Pockets Business Podcast, episode 51 uh, that Jay did uh, and his wife, Carol, not that long ago, a couple of weeks, two weeks ago, something like that. It definitely got my mind spinning as far as what it takes to be able to invest in businesses. And if you're thinking, oh, I don't have any money to invest in businesses, go listen to that podcast. You'll be blown away with the different creative strategies. It's just business buying is similar to real estate buying. It's actually very similar as far as structure. So you might be surprised. And those business owners out there that need to open back up, they're going to need help, right? And if you might be one of the people that might be able to help them out in some way. So get into that. For sure. The, the, the business we uh, we put under or verbally put under contract yesterday, um, large component of seller financing. Um, nice. So we, we, we the, the amount of cash we had to come with basically covers their hard assets, stuff that we could sell tomorrow and get all our money back. And the rest is seller financing, holding a note for a couple of years. So just pay them out of the cash flow. And we bought that for basically the value of one year's worth of profit in the company. So wow. the thought is uh, obviously this year is probably going to be worse than last year. Um, but the thought is that in a year we should be able to pay ourselves back for the purchase of that business. So that's right. in, in the equivalent of, of the, the real estate uh, world, that's a hundred percent cap rate deal. All right. We're going to be switching gears over to answering the questions that all you guys are ask, asking right now on Facebook and also the QA box. Once we get into that, we're going to start, we've probably got another, I'm going to steal these guys for another 30 minutes. So we got time. Uh, and I'm going to do a quick break to share with you guys as far as uh, how you guys can also watch the replay. We do this through Fixated on Real Estate. That is one of our events businesses that we run. You can actually go to fixatedonrealestate.com 
Uh, and through there, you can watch all the last webinars. You can also watch all, we got three years of content on there from videos that we've done uh, from different speakers, Brandon and Jay, they've all been on it before. Uh, and you can watch them on that anytime. It's free to join, completely 100% free because we're crazy. That's what we are. So uh, anyways, we also have our PNW Real Estate Expo coming up in August. We just switched the dates. Uh, we've also allowed this to become a virtual event. You guys can go to pnwrealestateexpo.com. Uh, AJ will be there. He just doesn't know it yet. So uh, actually, I think he's he going to be there. Brandon, Jay, all those guys will be there as well. This is our fourth event that we've done for it. Uh, last year, we had over 950 people at it, investors and over 50 exhibitors. Now, despite what's going on in the world, we are still doing it August 6th through the 8th in the Hyatt Regency downtown Seattle. There's also a virtual ticket option. So if you do not want to show up because you're afraid people are dirty, uh, then you can watch the whole thing virtually, get 100% of the recordings, and you can even participate in it virtually. We have an awesome, awesome technology system to allow us to do that now. It's not Zoom. It's way better. Uh, and you guys are going to be blown away from that. So you can get tickets now for that. Go to pnwrealestateexpo.com. Uh, and last but not least, if you are into skip tracing, please go to exactskip.com. That is one of the people that we work with quite a bit. Uh, and you can work in the skip tracing realm to be able to get all those leads and off-market stuff that you are looking for for finding these amazing deals that are out there. Moving on. So back on the polls, hey, I'm gonna share the hey, poll. Before you go there, can I show something? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, somebody asked uh, a very serious question and they were wondering if uh, somebody could Photoshop my beard onto your face. Uh, and so I did that. So. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you see it? Is it showing? Okay. Yeah, we see it. Yeah, that's yeah good. Awesome. So that's what we look like if my that's... beard was on your face and my hair on your hair. That is, I, I have a lot of work to do. So that's there was one of the comments. Really all about. <laughs> that is awesome. I'm sitting here thinking Brandon's it. being really quiet here. What's he doing? <laughs> now we know. So for those of you guys listening to the audio version of this, go ahead and look at your speakers right now. Uh, and you'll be able to see the Photoshop beard that Brandon just did. But uh, <laughs> the, no, I love Actually, when we were doing all the promotion for this, uh, we had a number of people because you have the, the uh, you got me, AJ and Brandon all with beards. And they're like, oh, it's the different levels of beard growing because, you know, mine is felt and aerodynamic. And then uh, AJ is nice and trimmed and Brandon's is, Homeless. you know, dragged. It's like, it's a, it's a, you can't even swim probably. You probably like hold you back. <laughs> you swim, but, it does. Yeah. I'm glad you went that drag and not other drag. <laughs> yeah. I, I, Brandon's beard. I, th I have a feeling if I had Brandon's beard, I would just do this all day long. <laughs> oh, I'd have you, oh, I'd you like, I just, I braid it and, you know, put beads in it and. Christmas lights. It's like when you're uncomfortable, you just twirl it around, right? Or you put it in your mouth and start chewing on it, right? <laughs> hey, all right. So for those of you guys listening to audio, I'm sure you guys can imagine all that. But uh, <laughs> the so let's get into the questions. One of the very actually, let's go back to the poll results. I did not share those yet. So the poll results. Most of you guys believe that the opportunity is going to be in single family residential, uh, multifamily. So that's maybe because most people listening to this are investing in those areas and maybe hoping and praying that would be the case. Uh, and of course, business acquisitions, some of you guys have no clue, which is fine, right? None of us do, <laughs> we just think. Uh, and, but there's quite a few opportunistic areas there. So uh, moving on, let's go to one of the first questions that was asked, which I really did appreciate. Uh, for the commercial spaces, so AJ, maybe you can help answer this. For commercial spaces, what are the concerns, this comes from Andy, what are the concerns with many employees working remotely and businesses looking at downsizing their office space? Yeah, this, that's a fantastic question. And this has been one, if you look what's going on in the commercial space, um, the changes that we have seen over the last 10 years have been dramatic and it's only going to continue. Um, the advent of online shopping, what's going on with Amazon, the displacement of workforce, people being able to live wherever they want, like in Hawaii, Brandon, and still work. Um, it's, you know, that's changing the landscape and now the expectations have changed. So expectations with millennials were like, I want to be more mobile and I should be able to have more freedom to work where I want, when I work, want. And a lot of companies were not, they were, they were fighting that. Well, after this test, there's a lot of people saying, listen, this worked. Now I want you to, you know, let me do this. And a lot of people will. When you look at the uh, commercial real estate space, things like retail, you know, there's so much going against that space. Um, we're, we're under contract in two properties right now. One's a Sears. We have another uh, uh, Kmart that we're looking at that we're going to buy both of those properties, turn them into storage facilities. 
um, and they're worth a fraction of what they were worth just 10, 15 years ago. Um, we're, we have concerns that this is also going to happen in other spaces like office building, where you're gonna see rents trend down, where you're gonna see more vacancy, but too, a lot of repurposing of the current real estate is gonna happen. A lot of opportunity there, right? If you repurpose assets to fit another purpose and you can buy them at the valuation of the new pur purpose, which is lower, you get the spread. And uh, um, there's so much opportunity because there's still so much up in the air and that's starting to change and that's, that's turning. So uh, how people view malls, you know, malls are being converted to apartment buildings. You have bowling all alleys being converted. You have all sorts of repurposing of commercial real estate that 20 years ago, no one could have even imagined. Yeah. Um, and so lots of people don't know what to do with them. So they're willing to sell them just to get rid of them. And if you can think outside the box, repurpose those things, um, there's huge opportunity in the commercial space for the next 10 years, because this is a change that is not, not only not going away, it's not slowing down, it's speeding up. Excellent. Good, good on perspective. Very good. Uh, the, so next question, how do you see Airbnb and vacation homes performing over the next six months? Who wants to take that? Zero percent cash on cash return. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, right now I'll, it is. Yeah. I'll speculate a little bit. So my assumption is once if this ended like next week and they didn't, this thing didn't resurge over and over and over, I think we'd be back to where we were before. I think in fact, a lot of people who cancel their travel plans are going to, it's like pushing all the travel from the first half of the year to the second half and it'll all kind of even out if this goes away and it's done for good in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so a lot of the Airbnb people will just, it'll just, fizzle out and they'll be fine. It'll be okay for the most part. Some people are obviously going to lose their properties and go bank. Yeah, survive, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think for the most part, we'll be back to normal. If this continues like every couple months, they shut us down again for a month or two, which I, if I had to, you know, wager, I'd guess 60, 40, that's what the case is going to be. But you know, we don't know. I think that's going to be a problem because who wants to go and spend all, you know, book a huge vacation. Like yesterday, my wife said, let's just book a, uh, our trip to Disney world. And I was like, but we don't even know if like, we're going to be allowed to do it. And what if they don't let us refund our tickets and our, you know, like, we don't know. So like, I'm just not booking anything until I know this is over for good. And I think that's going to be the general thing. So it really, those are the two options. If this, if this leaves up, we'll be fine. If it doesn't, I think Airbnb is in trouble as a company. I think they're in massive trouble, but as a, uh, you know, not just them, BRBO, everybody. BRBO, I mean, like, yeah, all of them are going to be in for, trouble for, for, a while. for I don't us. Know cash that they have. I don't follow that, but like, they're not. Well, the, I know on our end, Grace, Grace and I travel all the time, and we, you know, a lot. And so prior to right when this shut down, we had trips to Malibu, to San Diego. We had trips to Hawaii. We were supposed to be in Hawaii next week with you. Yeah, we were uh, hanging and, out. Yeah, hey, we had Jamie. to cancel those, and um, and we oh, had okay. a we weren't able to get our money back on our BRBO. Uh, that we had in Malibu for a group event that we were doing down there. I mean, like there was a, there's, but I did on another note, we did stay in Suncadia for the last 40 nights from Airbnb, not Airbnb, but kind of. Uh, and there was somebody there that we talked to. They had 70 plus Airbnbs, 52 of them or 53 of them were subleased Airbnbs for rental yeah. arbitrage. And they had zero tenant occupancy on those 50 plus units which meant they still owed rent still, right, on all those units as well. And they were, it was something like fifty five dollars or $60,000 a month in what they owed to those landlords. And they were like, in two months, I'm out of business. I'm bankrupt. So, um, AJ, you had something to say? Yeah. I, or no, Jay, I, sorry. No, no, AJ. I'm, I'm still in it. <laughs> Just real quick, uh, business models where you don't control the source of revenue or cash flow, we dislike those models very much. So when you are the intermediary, but you don't control the front end or the back end, you've lost control over your business. Um, and so that hack of uh, subleasing out to uh, you know, Airbnb is this is a time where those kind of models are just being devastated because the, the is you don't have control of getting the cash in the door, but yet you still assume all the liability. So um, yeah, we, we dislike those models greatly and think that they will struggle to perform and downturns generally, but really bad during these times. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm a little bit more pessimistic than Brandon. I, in 10 years, I don't think I've ever said I disagree with Brandon. Um, and, <laughs> but I disagree with Brandon on this one. Right, um, I, 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 think, I, I think that what we're likely to see when all this is over is at least a typical recession in terms of 
unemployment numbers in terms of, of other economic indicators. Uh, and what that entails is six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent unemployment. I think there are going to be a lot of people who um, who may have gone through a forbearance and now owe extra money on their mortgage. They may have uh, put off paying their rent and now they owe extra money on rent. Um, they weren't earning money for a few months. Um, the last thing I think these people are thinking about, not the last thing, but I, I think they're not going to be keen on going out and spending a lot of money on a $10,000 on a trip to Disney World. Um, because I mean, they've just gone through this, this difficult economic period. I think uh, the, the four of us probably aren't representative of a lot of the, the people that, that go to Disney World. Um, a lot of people are sitting there right now wondering how they're going to pay rent next month, um, not saving up money for their trip when, all the, when the lockdown ends. So I, I think that typically during a downturn, tourism gets hit hard. Um, and I think that, that once this all, is all over, tourism is going to get hit hard and there are going to be a lot of people who aren't traveling for a while. If they are traveling, it's going to be local travel to save money. Um, and here's the other thing. I I think if people are going to travel, they're going to choose the lowest price option for for um, for hospitality for 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 renting rooms. And Airbnb isn't necessarily going to see is Airbnb owners aren't necessarily going to drop their prices because they have to hit their margins, they have to hit their numbers, they have to make up for what they lost. Obviously, hotels have to do the same thing, but most hotels are are better capitalized and they can afford to to cut their margins uh, to get people back in. I think a lot of Airbnb owners aren't going to be able to cut their margins. They're going to hope that once all this is over, that they can go back to, to whatever rental rates they were seeing uh, three months ago. And they're going to be surprised when people are choosing low priced hotels over, over the higher priced mm -hmm. Airbnb. Interesting. So the but I wonder, just throw another just quick idea. So I wonder, and I have no idea on this, but let's just say that 30% of all Airbnbs right now that are operating at Airbnb, like a lot of them are, are going to arbitrage. A lot of them are just single landlords just trying to rent their apartment out, whatever. I'm guessing the inventory for those is going to go away. I mean, they're converting them to traditional rentals already. A lot of people are, right? So maybe what will happen then is there's going to be 30, 40% less Airbnb travel and 30 or 40% less inventory. And so it'll all just go back the same. I don't know. That's that, another. That's very possible. That, yeah. Can't argue that. Yeah. So great question. I agree. The, yeah, well, you know, so on a side note, we're told, so I, I, uh, I'm a brand ambassador with bigger pockets. Jay is too. And Brandon, you know, whatever, but uh, Jay and I have been told on calls multiple times, be more like Brandon, right? Multiple times from your pockets. So <laughs> Jay, you're about? supposed to agree to Brandon at all times about everything. <laughs> exactly. saying, so that's how I see no, it. no, they weren't saying be more like Brandon, like agree with him. They were saying uh, be better look, looking, be smarter, yeah, yeah. Be, yeah. have Pro more charisma. Here. I don't think that's what they meant. Yeah, Brandon, no. in, in actuality, that is literally what they meant. No, seriously. No, we've actually been told that on calls. So, <laughs> oh, all right. All right. Good. No I think what they want is the secret to being the secret to having lots of video views is just being like an, a, a caricature of yourself. And that's what I think they're referring to is larger than life. So instead no, of they're just saying be more likable yeah. and better. You gotta, yeah. You just got to move around like this all day. People <laughs> love this stuff. It's amazing. So uh, Rob is asking, would you suggest to avoid for now approaches such as Burr, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat? If the numbers work right now. So basically, if the numbers work right now, should you still avoid it or should you not? I'm concerned about the conditions by the time I need to refinance, right? Which is a good concern, especially let's think cash out refinance. Is that going to be because right now, cash out refinances are getting harder and harder and harder to get. Rates might be great, but a lot of banks are, eh, I don't know about cash out. So could changing the goal to purchasing with subject to our financing, all that great credit, credit, uh, creative stuff might be better. Uh, but let's focus more specifically on Burr, right? And this is even on the multifamily side because most value add multifamily is just in Burr, right? Uh, or they would say the opposite, right? Which is, that's been around longer than Burr. Uh, but that said, if you're investing in a Burr type property right now, are you concerned about the back end cash out refi on how do you get your money back? Is that something that's still going to be happening in the future? Or are lenders going to continue to get harder on cash out refinance? Right, even if liquidity is still there, because I see them very difficult right now. Yeah, all right. I think also, AJ, <laughs> you want to start? No. What do you guys? So, so I've answered this question a few times. So I'll take. I'll do a, a quick one. Um, what was that look, Tarl? I just kicked be my chair. more like Brandon. 
Yeah, I kicked my chair and it hurt. So that's, <laughs> um, to be honest. That's uh, I, I would say anybody that's thinking about doing a burr, ask yourself this question. What are you going to do if your primary exit strategy, your primary refinance strategy doesn't work out? If yep. you can't go to your local uh, portfolio lender, if you can't go to your local bank and do your refinance, what are you going to do? Have a plan B. If your plan B is I'm going to get foreclosed on and I'm going to have to lose the property, then don't do the burr. But if your plan B is either I've got cash in the bank if I really need it. I've got friends and family who can loan me the money if I really need it. I can go to my primary lender, the person that's lending me the money for the first six or 12 months while I do the burr. And I talk to them and I say, hey, if I can't do a cash out for a year or two or three, are you willing to extend this loan? Let's negotiate terms now. Let's say, okay, maybe I pay you an extra 2% uh, interest rate. Maybe I pay you one point and we extend for 12 months. Are you willing to do that now? Um, maybe you have a partner who says, hey, or, or a friend who says, hey, if you can't refinance us, I'll come in on this deal with you as, as an equity partner. <laughs> Figure out what your plan B and maybe even your plan C and plan D would be if you can't do that refinance. And as long as you have a reasonable plan B, plan C, absolutely go for it. If you have no plan B, no plan C, well, then you have to ask yourself, are you willing to take that risk? And that's, that's, a, that's up to everybody individually. That's good. That's pretty much what I was going to say. Um, I'll add that. the I know. I'm trying to be more like Brandon. Yeah, there you go. I think I'm trying to be more like Jay here. Uh, uh, yeah, the reason I like Burr so much and the reason we pushed it a lot, and I don't say pushed it, but we talk a lot about it over the last few years is because it does, in such a situation like this, it gives us a little bit of uh, flexibility in how to get out. For example, if you buy that property and you've got 30% equity in it, you could technically sell it for about a break even up to like the market dropping 30%. Uh, and so that's one thing I've always liked about it and because I knew at someday a recession would hit and you're, you could potentially sell it. And the market's likely, now I, I say, I've always said this and then it actually maybe is going to be true, but markets don't drop 30% overnight. Like it took what, four years from 08 to 2012 for the real estate market to completely crash. My assumption has always been it's going to do that again. Now, maybe we did get a 30%, we're going to see a 30% crash in three months. Uh, who knows? Um, but either way, like that's one thing I like about the burr. And so that's just my, my thought is, you could turn a burr. If you want to do a burr, maybe just backup plan flip. And if you can't do that, can you backup plan rent it? Can you backup plan? Uh, like what Jay said about the partnership, that's kind of how I'm flipping right now or trying to flip is I'm bringing in partners and saying, Hey, how about you fund this entire deal? Like cash, like people who have good money, you fund the entire deal cash. We'll split everything 50, 50 at the end. If it doesn't sell, we'll rent it out. You get all cash flow for as long as we own it until we someday do sell it. And then we'll split it then. Or you'll get, you know, like that way I have a backup plan that I can't lose on. And so just like Jay said, I'm just trying to think long-term, you know, how am I going to do this? Yeah, I, I, I went in, in times like this, I don't buy anything that I'm not going to own for 10 years, even though I may exit out of it. I have to be a hundred percent. Okay. Not refinancing and owning that property and not doing anything and living off the cash flow generated from it, because that just has to be the expectation, the refi or the turnaround of sell is the cherry on top. I think what a lot of people get in trouble um, with the burst strategy today, which is essentially what I do in uh, commercial storage facilities. I buy underperforming assets. We turn them around. We refinance. Uh, we stabilize. We refinance and we repeat. Um, when you're looking at this, I think the, the biggest problem people have with the burst strategy today is the underlining assumptions where they're getting from their revenue, their building, their financing at the beginning of their model changes during the time. And then that, that, that out, it, it doesn't work out how they thought it would. And then they just don't know what to do. Cause they're like, that's not what it did on paper, but that's because the underlying assumptions were either not correct, given how much has changed in just the last month, what you did six months ago is going to be different than today, or it took three months. And in three months, our world changed um, and financing things like that. Like we've, we've seen. And so you have to be okay with those numbers or those assumptions that you build in your model to change and still keeping it. Um, that's just a general rule that we have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tell people, I mean, people, we talk about pro and cons lists and we laugh about those, but I, I tell people literally when it comes to investing, you should be making risk and mitigation lists. Um, you should write down, literally write it down. 
here are all the things that I think could reasonably go wrong. And it, there's going to be deal risk. There's going to be investor risk. There's going to be market risk. I mean, risk in all different places. Write down all the things that could go wrong. The market drops 20% or rents drop 20% or vacancy goes up 10% um, or, or population goes down or the house burns down um, or my neighborhood, my, my homeowners association says we're not allowed to rent anymore. Write down all the reasonable risks for any particular investment. And then next to it, write down, this is what I would do if that happens. And once you have all those written down, it's pretty easy to go back and say, based on all the things that could happen and how I would respond to those, it becomes a lot clearer if that's a reasonable risk to take or not. Or hand that list to somebody else and say, given the risks and the mitigations, um, would you do this deal? This is, I mean, it's no different. I mean, we're all investors. If you're watching this, you either are an investor or a striving investor. Investing is about mitigating risk, period, like on a number of levels. So it's no different, right, whether it's here or later. I would say on the Burr strategy, what Brandon had said earlier about, could you flip it if it doesn't work out, right, or whatever it might be. Here's the best advice you can give anybody on Burr. If it's not a good flip, it's not a good Burr, right? Mm -hmm. And so, period. So you can have a good flip that's not a good Burr, but you can't have a good Burr that's not a good flip. So if you're, so for us, even just a, a couple of weeks ago, we had a house that we originally bought that was for a burst strategy. We bought it for 114,000 and it was uh, in Tacoma, Washington. We originally were to keep it as a burr. The rehab got out of hand, sewer repair ended up being 14 grand, a bunch of other stuff kind of happened with it. And I go, you know what? It's only going to cash flow hundred bucks a month. And with the way that the market is right now and all that kind of stuff, let's sell it. And it sold for 265 and we still made almost 40 grand on it. Uh, and and I moved on, right, when it came to it. So because we still had an exit strategy of it being a flip uh, if it didn't work out. So if you're stuck in a situation where you've already bought it and you can't get rid of it kind of a thing, then you got to get creative and figure out how to do it but um, or hold on to it. The other advice on real estate that I've heard over the years from really smart people is if it's a bad property right now, just wait. Now, you might have to wait 10, 15 plus years, right, maybe longer, but eventually real estate figures itself out, right? but you have to survive during that time. That's the only downside. So, um, okay, so moving on to the next question. Some of the questions that you guys asked, even though I've been uploading, they might not be to the topic or we've already kind of answered it in some way. So don't take events that if we don't ask it. Uh, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but let's recap on this again. Uh, Robert's asking, do you foresee a lot of foreclosures due to forbearances that we're seeing? There's 3.2 million of forbearances right now from what he's saying. Uh, and do we see more coming into that? I would also add unemployment because we had Dave Van Horn uh, on the last webinar we did, and he's seen that his biggest indicator on defaults and foreclosures for years has always been unemployment, right? And with unemployment spiking up, most of those might be furloughs, right? Uh, do we see something going into that area where foreclosures, defaults, everything are continue to go forward, right? And then what, how does that affect our industry? Thoughts? I'll start with the first one. Um, so Fannie Mae did clarify earlier this week that they are not going to tell people that if you miss three months of payments, you have to make a, a balloon payment of three months the day everything's over. So Fannie has some pretty clear guidelines on how they deal with, with forbearances. And it's basically, um, you can either set up a payment plan, you can tack it on the end. In some cases, um, you can do a loan modification in some cases. Um, but Fannie Mae was, was very uh, purposeful in, in clarifying that they're not going to be putting people in a situation where they're just going to have a big balloon payment in a couple months. So that says to me um, that there's less risk than, than what we may have were concerned about a, a week ago about forbearances and how it's going to impact uh, the foreclosure market moving forward. Um, now, as for the second part, I'll let AJ or Brandon, or I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to, to take the stage here, but um, the second part, like, are we going to see uh, unemployment go up and how's that going to affect it? Yeah, it's possible. AJ, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, we think this, we think the government is going to be very hands-on continually until we reach a point um, for a while. It's, they're not, they've made it very clear. They've set the stage. Um, they've shut down the economy and they're going to become the economy now for a while. And they're not going to deviate from that because they already started and you can't. Um, so we don't see that changing anytime soon, particularly because we don't believe it's ending anytime soon. Um, unemployment is 
skyrocketing and will continue to. The government will have to supplement um, because they made the decision to a lot of this. And unlike the government flipping the light switch off, which just ended the economy, you don't flip the light switch back on. And it doesn't work like that. Um, when you have 20% unemployment and you have companies that have changed the way that they operate to you know, deal with that less of employees, flipping on a light switch doesn't automatically rehire 20% of the economy. Um, it doesn't work like that. So I don't think that, I think it'll be continual. We're gonna keep seeing it. And I don't think the government's gonna be out of this until we're back to a new normal because they've set the standard and, and they caused it. And I think it's gonna, they are gonna be more involved for longer than they expected to be or wanted to be. Yeah, I got nothing to add. I mean, that's- <laughs> That's all good stuff. Yeah. my points, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's and the, anyway, I'm, I'm, I was gonna get my soapbox again, I'm not gonna do it. So uh, <laughs> we want, we're gonna start wrapping up here and I wanna end with one, a question that was brought to us on the last, uh, Q and A. And for those of you guys, you guys asked a lot of questions. Trust me, we're saving those questions. We're doing our best to, to shift our webinars to that. Some of us are actually using some of these questions to help out on bigger pockets and some other forums to be able to get them answered in other ways. Uh, so keep asking them. We're definitely tracking them. Uh, and we have a whole backlog that we're just trying to get to as much as possible. But one of the questions that I liked that I wanted to ask you guys to kind of also working on ending on it is that, and we'll go to each of you guys, what do you suggest people not do right now when it comes to their real estate businesses? What do you suggest that people not do, right? And it can't be like stupid, like, you know, go kick out all your tenants, that kind of stuff, whatever. But, uh, you know, what is some, and it could be any kind of suggestion. What's the number one thing that you could pop in your head right now of what not to do? Um, don't do what the government does and just be reactive. Um, keep yourself in control. Look at the bigger picture, the longer picture, um, realize that particularly in times like this, things are changing so fast, you shouldn't be changing your long-term plans due to short-term incremental changes. That's a recipe for disaster. Keep a cool head, realize that, you know, things like this are going to pass. And if you're thinking 10 years down the road, you know, decisions tomorrow are going to be way better and pay off a lot, a lot more. Jay? I, I love that answer. I mean, that was, yeah. that was, that was great. Yeah. Think long-term. Um, I was going to say something similar. I was going to say, don't be impatient. Um, don't, don't do a deal just to do a deal. I know there are a lot of people who are used to doing deals, um, used to doing maybe many deals a year. And now they've been sitting around locked inside, not doing any deals. And, and they're feeling like, up. Oh, everybody's kind of getting ahead of me and more people, Brandon's buying uh, mobile home parks and AJ is buying uh self-storage and Jay's buying businesses and all I'm doing is sitting here watching TV. Well, stop watching TV. Um, but that doesn't mean you necessarily need to, to go out and be doing deals right now. Uh, again, now's a great opportunity to, to go. You want to learn about self-storage. AJ's got the greatest self-storage podcast in the world. You want to learn about mobile home parks. Brandon Turner's got some great mobile home information. Um, now's the time to be learning. Don't get impatient. Don't do a deal just because you feel like you're supposed to be or because anybody else is doing anything. Brandon. Yeah, my, mine's similar to what Jay said. And you kind of touched on it, Jay, but I'll say it anyway, is don't get lazy. I think people look for excuses in their life to quit things. I think they look for excuses in their life to like, it's like, well, I'm going to go jogging today, but uh, it looks like rain. I think I'll sit down, right? Like, even though like, who cares? Like go run in the rain. Um, the same thing is true for like, well, I was going to do real estate this year, but pff, this whole COVID thing is making it difficult. So I'm going to sit and watch TV, like Jay said. So that, that's, I would say, don't be lazy. Look at this as an opportunity uh, and, and ask yourself, how do I become better during this? It's that whole, like, don't wish it were easier, wish you were better kind of yeah. Jim Rohn mentality. So you can yeah. still, you can still take action. You can still commit. I mean, maybe go get your real estate license, maybe start yeah. getting your, if, if that's something you want to do and it's going to be good for your business, do that. Now go get a bigger pockets pro subscription because that'll, that'll give you some benefits. See, you like that, Brandon? I'm being more All like right. Brandon. Um, like Brandon. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can commit, you can take action and commit and move forward without actually going out and buying a deal. Most of the largest businesses that are started, started in recessions. My company started out of a recession. Um, it, you know, recessions, you, you don't grow during good times. You grow during bad times. It shows cracks and weaknesses and flaws and assumptions. And if you can turn and face those and analytically look at them and change and get better through these times, those are the answers, right? Um, you know, 
the obstacle is the way, so to speak. And if you can solve those problems doing during now instead of sitting back, once again, you're setting yourself up for success forever. These are momentary times and they're short times, but they tell us a lot more about ourselves than good times do. I want to add that my final thought on that is uh, don't regret, right? And don't be, in, and also don't self hate. So there's a lot of people that might be looking at uh, what they did in the past and they might be looking at what they have currently right now and be like, oh, man, I'm so messed up. Why is this happening right now? I should have been better, that kind of thing. Well, you're not the only person sitting there doing that. This is a world issue, right? That's affecting all of us. And I found myself at times about three, four weeks ago, just pissed, like pissed, <laughs> like on so many levels. And, and I realized that like, wait, there's nothing I can do about this right now other than the things I can control. So what are those things I can control and not panic because the long run, like you said, AJ, is a big, big factor when you start thinking long run. And if there are changes that you need to make in your business, now's the time to start adjusting and making changes because you have the time to do it. Don't think you're the only one, right? Don't self-hate on that because uh, all of us are going through something when it comes to this. And that kind of helped me to realize I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not alone, right? Other people are doing this. I didn't create this issue. So, uh, but that said, um, all my other issues I created though. So, uh, so adding on that, Brandon, how can people get a hold of you? Well, before I say that, I have a question for you guys. Uh, yeah. Did you guys hear about like, you know, the whole movie theater issue? Like they're all shut down right now. Did you hear about though, before that happened, uh, why the, uh, why the 15 year old pirate couldn't get into the movie theater? Cause the movie was rated R. Ah. <laughs> You're ah. such a <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> does your son even understand any of this stuff yet or no? no not yet. We're going to get there. Uh, you can find me. I'm like a 13 year old girl. I'm on Instagram and TikTok. I'm just starting TikTok. I try to stay away from it, but I'm mainly Instagram. Beardy Brandon on Instagram. Beardy Brandon. Jay Scott. Beardy Brandon. Um, everybody Beardy knows Jay where to find Instagram. me. Um, Jay Scott Investor on Facebook. Jay Scott underscore one, two, three flip on Instagram. Jay Scott on bigger pockets. Uh, Jay Scott.com. And if you want to send me an email, J, the letter J at Jay Scott.com. And Mr. Yeah, AJ. Instagram, AJ Osborne on Instagram. Um, and then uh, self storage income. If you want to know about self storage, it's the podcast. Um, so, yeah, Instagram, Facebook, podcast, everywhere. Sites, everywhere. Yeah. Email. Like, uh, there's, there's a great book, um, How to Live with a Seal. And uh, the seal on there, which is um, David Goggins, there's a whole title that says, Google me mother blinker, right? So that's basically what you're all saying is Google me mother blinkers. But anyways, much, yeah. um, the, for, on that note, we are doing these webinars every two weeks. The next one is going to be on May 13th and be on the lookout for that. If you guys register via Zoom, you'll get notified later about the next webinar. Uh, and you can watch the past webinars uh, on whether it's on bigger pockets or you can watch it on fixateonrealestate.com. Make sure you guys send any questions that you guys have. We are tracking that stuff. On your link when you register for Zoom, there's an email address there that you can send more questions to uh, if you have them. And we thank all you guys for joining us. Uh, and we, I know we did not get to all your questions. There's literally 100 plus questions. Uh, and that's why we're doing these to try to do our best to help out answering as much as we can. Keep tracking on bigger pockets. Go to fixateonrealestate.com. Check out our expo, pnwrealestateexpo.com. Uh, and we will see these guys again in the future, no doubt. Thanks again, guys. Thanks. Thank appreciate it. Bye.